Hi, Robert. Can you hear me? I can, Terry. How are you? Great. Thanks for taking the time. So uh, this is a taped interview that we will use in stories that will play out in a couple of weeks on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, the Today Show, MSNBC, all our various platforms. So thank you for taking a couple of minutes to get us on your schedule today. Sure. Okay, so um, first, uh, first off, could you say your first and last name so when an editor pulls this tape out and looks at it in a couple of, a couple of weeks, they'll know what they're looking at? <laughs> sure. My name is Bob Bankin. And to be clear, you do you, you go by Bob, not Robert, right? I do. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, first question, the elephant in the room, uh, COVID-19. How has that impacted uh, your training uh, for the mission and then also what will be occurring on launch day? You know, it's been interesting as we've kind of gone through the, the pandemic and kind of adapted to COVID-19. For us, uh, what's really happened is the normal quarantine that astronauts go through about uh, two weeks prior to launch to really ensure that we don't take anything uh, to the International Space Station or get the crew on orbit sick or, or be sick when we get on orbit. Uh, we've had to kind of stretch out and kind of begin uh, closer to 10 weeks prior, uh, frankly, which has been a, a little bit of a, of a difference, but uh, it's actually been kind of nice that all of our families were kind of going through that same experience. And so we're kind of all on the same page in terms of how to operate. It wasn't a training program at the two week uh, point. It's been a, a good solid 10 weeks of being in quarantine. And, and will it look different on launch day? Will there be less people going up the elevator into the gantry, or will it look fairly similar to what we've seen in the past on, on shuttle launches? Certainly in, in terms of uh, our crew getting strapped into the vehicle, of course, it's a Dragon capsule, so it'll be different than the shuttle, but they're not making a lot of changes in terms of the number of people that are uh, required to get us uh, uh, strapped in and ready to go. Uh, as you know, it's already a, a little bit of a dangerous environment out there with uh, hypergalls, uh, you know, rocket propellant loaded on the vehicle, if you will, that we need to protect people from. What will be different is uh, the causeway and the number of guests who will be able to watch from a distance, normally in large groups, kind of uh, looking across the water and seeing the launch happen. Uh, we're not expecting that to be possible based on the COVID-19 situation. And so uh, folks will be uh, hopefully watching uh, uh, at home uh, on, on, on their computers or on the television uh, when we launch into space rather than seeing it with their own eyes, which is, you know, it's a, a little bit of a, a disappointment. But uh, uh, with the situation, I think it's, a, it's the right thing for folks to stay protected. You touched on what my next question was going to be. You've fl obviously flown past shuttle missions. What are the differences to the, between the Crew Dragon and the shuttle? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could talk for hours about it, but what, the main thing, when you're there in the cockpit, what is it, what's going to look different when people look at those cameras from over your shoulder? You know, the, the two big differences really are the shuttle was a, a hauling truck. It could take a big payload into orbit in addition to the, uh, the crew members that were headed to Space Station, for example. So the, the Dragon is a, is a smaller capsule, so it'll only be seats for four people in there, and Doug and I will be in uh, two of them. So a smaller crew, uh, not a lot of cargo. It'll also look a lot more modern on the inside. Uh, the, the shuttle was uh, built uh, decades ago and had a lot of uh, switch interfaces that maybe folks would be familiar with if they looked at uh, old hardware. Uh, the Dragon is gonna look a lot newer and modern and sleek, uh, a touchscreen interface. There certainly still are some uh, buttons and switches and lights, uh, but it is uh, definitely a lot cleaner cockpit uh, than, the, than the space shuttle was. How overall has, uh, it's been nine years since we've, we've put men up, up on a U.S. rocket. How has technology changed in that nine year period? Uh, any specifics jump out at you as a drastic difference? I mean, even the spacesuits look different. Uh, give me some examples of that if you could. You know, it's really been uh, exciting to see the way that SpaceX has incorporated and innovated to try to bring new technology into the spaceflight arena. And so for crews that are launching into space, you know, when we did it with crews for the space shuttle, we were doing it with some really old hardware. I think uh, laptops hadn't been invented, of course, when we started flying the space shuttle. And so we used to Velcro and duct tape all those things into place so that we could fly our space shuttle mission. Now all that capability is really incorporated on board the vehicle and internalized so that it uh, does make for a, a nice clean cockpit. Uh, uh, they've also been really innovative and quick to incorporate new 
features or hardware opportunities into the, uh, into the Dragon vehicle. So, for example, things that might take uh, years to change on a space shuttle, if you could ever get them changed, uh, they've been able in just a few short months in many cases to, to incorporate something new. So we've got a, a nice tablet interface that we can use to keep track of things in addition to you know, the, the regular vehicle uh, interfaces. And so I've just been really excited to see the innovation and how quickly you know, commonplace items can end up on board the, uh, the SpaceX vehicle. Um, question if you can look ahead, uh, on launch day, what, what are your emotions going to be? Nervous, excited, how do you think you're feeling? You know, I think that uh, I have answered this, uh, this, this question uh, uh, several times, and I, I think it's something that's unique about the, kind of the, the folks that are selected to be astronauts. I, I expect us to have a, a, a little bit of excitement going into the mission, but also tempered with a kind of an extreme focus on being able to execute the things that are in front of us. and. Uh, you know, that folks often talk about, are, are you afraid of the mission? Are you afraid to ride a rocket or things like that? I think in, in our experience, we're actually most afraid of making a mistake and, and uh, uh, kind of taking away the, the, the progress or the success of the mission from the folks that have worked so hard to make it possible. And so, you know, I, I really expect a, the, maybe a tinge of ner nervousness, but that's really going to be, it's really going to be dominated by that, uh, you know, precise focus on, on everything that's in front of us to pull off a, a mission like this. And I, my clock is ticking out. Uh, I think I got time for one more. Um, you, you touched on the work with SpaceX and, and how that's different than, than just the NASA days. How is that different, and are you confident in SpaceX and their product? You know, one of the things that's really been interesting over the last couple of years as we've uh, uh, learned to work with our, our commercial partners is, is how both SpaceX and NASA have evolved to work together. You know, uh, it, it takes a lot of uh, confidence and audacity to pull off a, a human spaceflight mission, but uh, you also need to be a little bit paranoid that uh, things can get complicated really quick and you need to be prepared for that. And so I think uh, maybe that uh, preparation piece has come from the NASA side and the, that audacity piece maybe has come from the SpaceX side and we've kind of merged it together uh, to get where we are right now, from my perspective at least. We've had to both uh, kind of modify what our expectations are, both uh, both SpaceX and NASA kind of coming together in the middle. Great, thanks. I've not been given the wrap, but thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll get to meet face-to-face -face down the road when all, we're past all this. So. All, all this uh, COVID thing or, or in some sort of uh, virtual space as well. Thank you, Terry. All right, have a good, good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, Rachel Crane from CNN, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, I just want to get right into it. For years, the U.S. has been paying Russia upwards of $80 million per seat to get U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station. So what is the significance of bringing these missions back to American soil? I think there's a lot of significance, Rachel, to, to bringing these missions back to American soil. First, as you alluded to, kind of uh, an alternative to the Soyuz solution that's out there, which gives us uh, both uh, uh, an alternative for some political reasons, but also uh, some robustness if we should find a problem with the Soyuz vehicle and need an alternative. But uh, as an American, I I'm just proud of what we'll be able to accomplish to and fly again on an American rocket from American soil. This is something that we'll have achieved, and as an American, I'll be proud of it when we've accomplished it. Now, Demo 2 is hardly the first time you've put your life on the line. You've been to space twice already. Prior to that, you were a test pilot. But, you know, humans have never flown in a spacecraft, and you're a father now. So does that add an extra layer of anxiety to this mission for you? Certainly, after, you know, having a child and being a father, there is a, a different level of preparation. Uh, both to share the mission with my son, which is something I'm super excited to have the opportunity to do. Of course, he's only seen uh, pictures and video from before he was born from my previous missions. Um, but uh, certainly there is risk associated with a, a mission like this as we go forward. Um, but I do want him to know that uh, it's a mission that I feel strongly about. It's, uh, it's going forward in a way that I think is important for for us uh, uh, as humans, but uh, as Americans as well. And I want him to be proud of his father uh, um, as we kind of go forward with the mission.
Now, in normal times, you know, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the country would flock to the Space Coast, line the causeway to watch this historic space flight. But they're being told to stay at home because of COVID-19. Does the pandemic cloud this launch? Uh, from, from my perspective, the, the pandemic itself uh, doesn't... Uh uh, really change what we're trying to accomplish here. We're trying to do something that, uh, you know, Americans have accomplished again, flying a, off the Florida coast on an American rocket. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, what folks share for, with me as the creative way that they've been able to still follow along with the mission, whether that's uh, at home or in uh, uh, kind of a family viewing area, they've been able to watch it or kind of uh, uh, separated in another way as they try to follow uh, the constraints that uh, we need to live under so that we can uh, remain safe and kind of uh, uh, get this virus under control so we can get back to some uh, more sense of uh, normalcy. But uh, uh, I don't think it, it clouds in any way. It will just change the experience and how people are able to, uh, in, in some sense, uh, uh, share it and, and you know, absorb it as, it as it actually happens. Now, you and Doug have known each other for ages. You were even at each other's weddings. So does that relationship, how does that help you in the cockpit, that history? One of the things that's uh, really helpful for us as a crew is the long uh, relationship that uh, Doug and I have had. You know, we're kind of at the point in, uh, in our experience, whether it's uh, flying in the T-38 or uh, executing uh, in a SpaceX uh, simulation or, or approaching and docking to the International Space Station where we, in addition to, you know, finishing each other's sentences, you know, we can predict, you know, almost by body language what the, the person's opinion is or what they're going to, what their next action is going to be. And so our efficiency when we work through malfunctions or, or cooperate to kind of deal with situations that are presented uh, to us uh, as we prepare for the space flight or we execute the space flight, you know, we just, we just can save that much more time as we try to work together and go forward. You know, we, are, we don't surprise each other. We remain predictable, and uh, we've just been doing that so long that it's, uh, it's kind of like having a second set of hands or a second set of eyes because I can trust he's going to jump off and do his piece. I'll jump off and do my piece. I know where he's going to stop. We know how we're going to hand back together to continue on cooperating. So it's like uh, cooperating on a sports team. You know, pulling off a, a football play or a, in basketball or otherwise, where we know our role, we execute it, and we're, we try to be reliable and predictable as, uh, as we do it to be as successful as we can. Now, SpaceX designed, built, owns, and operates Crew Dragon. NASA is just the customer. So uh, how does that new relationship change the experience for the astronauts like you? You know, for us as astronauts, uh, the relationship that SpaceX has uh, with owning the vehicle and operating the vehicle has, a, has a, an interesting asterisk next to it, which is that uh, inside the vehicle, we do have a lot of capabilities that we need to know how to use um, should uh, problems arise. And so uh, we have uh, uh, spent a lot of years uh, developing what those capabilities should be to keep the crew safe. We, we primarily focus on putting capabilities in the crew ha crew's hands that allow them to uh, safely make it back from, from their space mission. And so we really have focused on those things and making sure that they're very robust and in place the way that you'd want them. If you were going to put your lives in the hand of a spacecraft, there'd be some things that uh, you'd still need to be able to do to, to make sure that you could safely come home. Um, that being uh, caveated with, of course, the SpaceX team has kind of facilitated getting us to that point. So they've designed the vehicle that they, the way that they would like it to provide us these features that put us in control at, uh, at specific times or in specific situations. And one last question. It wasn't always clear that it was going to be you flying. This new generation of spacecraft, Boeing, has also been uh, developing a crew capsule for years. Uh, so how does it feel that it's you and SpaceX that won this race? Well, uh, you know, the, the race isn't over until it's over. We definitely uh, feel like we're uh, in the lead to make it to the International Space Station and uh, retrieve the flag that STS-135 uh, left behind. But uh, we aren't really focused on who's going to win and who's going to lose. We really are focused on making sure that we technically, you know, get into space and get this vehicle checked out and 
accomplish the ultimate mission, which isn't winning against Boeing. It's uh, providing this capability to the International Space Station so that we can start rotating crews from uh, American soil. So that's the, the mission that's in front of Doug and I is, is providing that capability and getting this vehicle checked out so that the, the next mission on a SpaceX vehicle will be as uh, successful and, and be able to focus really on the mission of Space Station, which is that science and research that needs to happen up there. Well, Bob, thank you so much. Certainly looks like you guys are gonna win this race here. Really appreciate the time and can't wait to be on the ground with you in Florida and watch this amazing launch. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, look forward to you guys getting able to see it. It should be a great show. Thank you. Uh, Bob, Doug sort of dodged this question, but I'm trying to see if you're willing to go for it. Uh, what's your call sign and how did you come by it? Um, did he, you, you ask him the question about me or did you ask him the question about him? About him, and he uh, said, too long to tell. Oh, yeah, the call signs are, are long stories, I think. And so uh, uh, mine was, uh, I just they called me Dr. Bob, uh, which was kind of funny. I think when I showed up to my first military unit, I was a lieutenant, which is, of course, a pretty junior ranking officer in the, uh, in the Air Force. And I went to a research lab, and uh, it kind of got questionable at times where the Lieutenant Bob would have an opinion. And uh, it was more important that Dr. Bob had an opinion in the, in the technical community than Lieutenant Bob. So that uh, kind of name stuck uh, after that when I came to test pilot school. Do you remember what you wrote on your application as an astronaut about why you wanted to be an astronaut? That's a, a, a really good question uh, in terms of what I wrote on that. Uh, let me think for a minute if it, what I would have written on that uh, application. You know, I, I can't remember exactly what the words were. We used to have to write a, a short uh, uh, a paragraph to kind of present to the, the, the audience there in the selection board. Um, I expect that what I, I wrote on that point was that I, I really was already um, doing the role of, uh, of an astronaut as a flight test engineer at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and I really liked the job that I was doing and, and thought that uh, uh, just the next extension was, you know, to go off and, and be an astronaut. So I, I think it was most likely a scenario along those lines that I'm effectively, you know, doing the same thing for airplanes right now and just take it to the next level. So you're part of an astronaut family. I mean, you're flying a historic mission. Megan saved Hubble. What's dinner talk like at your house? You know, luckily for us in, in our house, uh, dinner talk can be really focused on other things uh, outside the astronaut office because uh, between uh, my wife and I, we kind of already know all the work stuff. And so we don't have to rehash it uh, over dinner and talk too much about what happened at work because she's seeing the same uh, email traffic that I am. So inside of our house, we're luckily able to, you know, focus on our family or focus on our son or, or these days uh, uh, focus how we're going to manage around the, you know, the pandemic or otherwise to, to keep our lifestyle as normal as possible, just like everybody so else. You, you talked about Voyager and how inspiring Voyager was. Um, how has Voyager taken you to this point? You know, you for me, NASA's missions over the years are just kind of uh, things that have kind of punctuated uh, uh, kind of my experience. And so whether it's uh, looking at imagery of a, a Viking lander or uh, on, a, on a television screen and kind of seeing those, those, those images of uh, the Martian surface, which was you know, pretty, pretty inspiring as a child to see those sorts of things happen. So that was normal to me. Uh, when the Voyager probes were sending back their data and you know, we didn't live in an internet age, you had to, I had to wait at least for the annual to come back from the encyclopedias with, uh, with how many new moons had been discovered around uh, one of the gas giants. Uh, it just gave me, I, I looked forward to those things. It uh, gave me an appetite for science that uh, was around that science uh, in, the, in the annual uh, encyclopedia uh, books, if you will, when the uh, when there wasn't new Voyager data that was coming back. And so that, that's really what it did for me. And, you know, that extended all the way through, you know, things that might normally not be experiences that, uh, that uh, children 
or you know, you know, kids growing up to uh, transition to adults, like the, the loss of Challenger, where I was glued to the television to watch the, the hearings to try to see what had happened that day to explain why we had lost that space shuttle. Uh, to see you know Richard Feynman do do his thing uh, uh, during that process with the O-ring, and then end up at Caltech years later, of course, with his legacy there. It's it's just interesting to me how these things were all interconnected, and, and really those uh, science missions that uh, NASA executed in the 70s really, I think, were were my motivation to end up where I am today. So you know about the risk. So how do you reconcile the risk of these missions versus the reward? From a risk versus reward perspective, I really view the continued pushing of the envelope as an important thing to do. That's how we learn from a science and engineering perspective. And so uh, uh, kind of that's where, you know, where I come out as far as the risk versus reward. I think continuing to push into space challenges us as challenges us as Americans, challenges us as scientists and engineers. And I think that that continued push uh, uh, is important. I think the endeavor is a, is a good one because there's just so much uh, scientific data that is uh, collected in that same process. Of course, you can push the, uh, the, the envelope in different ways as well. And I, and I salute the folks that do it with undersea missions or, or, or other aspects where the, the engineering challenge is just uh, uh, to take humans to a specific location is, is just uh, almost overwhelming at times, but they figure out a way. And last question, you know, the number of people have gone to space numbers in the hundreds, but it feels like we're sort of on the cusp of opening up space flight to many more. What would that mean to our understanding of the universe as a species to broaden this out? I think there are, are many things that we learn as a species have, as more people are exposed to uh, space missions, what the preparation takes, how we operate together uh, internationally, cooperatively to, to execute things. I, I think, uh, you know, in a, in a microcosm, you know, we, we hear this piece as astronauts, this overview effect that you're able to look down on the Earth and, and you're changed in some way by an appreciation that there aren't country boundaries or the fragility of the Earth, all, all those things kind of come to the forefront. You know, I think we're all experiencing some of that as well right now with this uh, pandemic situation where uh, that has connected us all in a way internationally that uh, causes us to reconsider our connection and, and how important it is for us to kind of work together kind of uh, uh, going forward. So thank you very much for your time, Bob. Godspeed. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. Hopefully you'll be watching. I will. Oh, hey, Bob. Um, Marcia done talking to you. I'm looking at your launch pad out my window. Um, you and Doug are going to be the first true NASA test pilots since Young and Crippen. Um, from a personal standpoint, how big is this flight coming up and, and your role in it for you personally? You know, it's it's really interesting to try to, to think about the, the role that we'll play in history as we go forward. But I think for both Doug and I, and I think we've, we've said this uh, a lot of times, is that we're going to focus on the, our role in history kind of after we've uh, successfully accomplished the mission. I think uh, there are just so many technical factors and, and things that we need to focus on to make sure that we pull this off, that uh, our place in, in history or, you know, even trying to put our names in the same sentences as, uh, as the folks who uh, have come before us is a... Uh, uh, it, it seems premature until until we've uh, until we've uh, pulled it off. Well, you know, um, you're, you're even color coordinated between the rockets, the spacesuits, the capsules, the Tesla cars going to the pad. Uh, um, how important is it to 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 inspire through um, visuals like that? Not just what you're doing, but you're doing it in such visual style is what is the way I see it. Could you comment on that, please, too? I, I think that. You know, whenever you kind of go forward as a as something that you're trying to use as a as a, a motivation or uh, uh, or a, a mission that you have the responsibility to share with a, a wide audience, it's certainly important to present it in the most positive or the most complete or or, or um, successful light that you can. I, I think that uh, you know there are different ways to accomplish that. I think if you look at the launch and entry suit that we wore during the uh, uh, space shuttle missions, I think 
in, in some sense, that suit became iconic uh, associated with the mission that was in front of it. I think still when you go and you look um, in movies, if they're trying to pretend to be astronauts, you'll often see something that's akin to a space shuttle uh, launch an entry suit because, or the ascent entry suit, because people are so familiar with that, that visual, and it's it's become in, in and of itself its own piece of iconery. Now, we're, what we're doing on the on the SpaceX side, and, and the direction that they've chosen is to kind of reach back and and kind of pull forward a maybe a, a retro styling or a, a different way of creating their own unique uh, kind of mission. Um, symbol or symbology rather than trying to uh, copy what was done on the on the space shuttle side. So I think both of those ways work. You can do it the way where you create uh, something that already is uh, 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 in the history, um, like copying the space shuttle suit or copying something a little bit more like science fiction. But uh, both of them have succeeded, I think, in terms of becoming iconic in terms of, you know, symbolizing uh, the, the mission in front of us or the the, the excitement associated with uh, what we're going to accomplish. Well, what about riding a Tesla to the pad? I mean, Tesla is the car of space travel, I suppose, right? <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's balances with that as well. I think uh, the, the Tesla is what we take to the pad, but uh, uh, if you look at what we have in place from a contingency perspective, you know, it's, a, it's an armored personnel carrier that we would uh, come back if we did have a hiccup that was out there. And so there's, a, there's some importance to, you know, you can look at those two things and look at them as one as a launch and entry suit on the space shuttle side versus uh, the, the space shuttle suit. You can look at that MRAP and uh, park next to a Tesla. And they all have their role and uh, are trying to accomplish different aspects of the, of the mission as required. Well, I'm, I'm presuming your wife and son will be coming to the launch, that they're not going to have to stay away. Um, is that so? And will they be able to visit you in crew quarters once you're quarantined there at JSC and then here at KSC? Uh, the intent, I think, going forward is to include our immediate families in that uh, quarantine bubble. You know, we've effectively had to do that as a part of the COVID-19 situation where we still need to have some place to live. It's impractical to jump into quarantine, um, particularly with the situation evolving as it was uh, just a couple of months ago. And so we're already in quarantine with our families and we uh, plan to continue that. Uh, NASA has a plan to get our families to Kennedy in a quarantine fashion and then to uh, allow us to continue to see each other. Um, and it's, you know, in some sense, it's actually a, a little bit easier with the other restrictions we expect from a guest perspective that our, our spouses won't won't have a lot of uh, uh, outside contacts uh, reaching out to them uh, in Florida, most likely. Well, I know your wife is an astronaut, um, but your other family members, um, are they more worried about you riding a new rocket like this than they were for your shuttle launches? Are you, are you sens sensing more tension among other family members and close friends? I, I think that from a close friends perspective and family perspective, um, it, it's really hard from a rocket perspective to try to break down and say this rocket is more risky than another rocket. I think rocket flights in general are kind of all best get it in that case of, uh, you know, flying in space has risk associated with it. And so I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see a, a different level of expectation. They do uh, often ask questions about our ability to interact with uh, the commercial provider with SpaceX in this case versus uh, our interaction with uh, the NASA team and, and how that's going because they kind of view us all wearing the same NASA badge uh, when we were executing the, the space shuttle missions. Uh, but uh, as you know, you follow it closely, more closely than family members do. There's a, a deep part of the uh, aerospace community that, that is you know, in the process of making sure operations on space station are conducted safely as well. That's not all NASA calculation and hardware that's built. There's a, there are a lot of companies and, and, and folks that support that uh, hardware or analysis uh, piece of it. And so we have to build good relations with uh, those folks in order to be safe on space station. And we've had to do the same with, uh, with SpaceX. And you know, given four or five years, uh, we've had a, a long time and I think pretty, pretty successful based on where we are right now. Well, you know, everybody always wants to know how astronauts go to the bathroom in space, and how is that going to work on Dragon? I understand you have an actual toilet on Dragon. Is that just sort of a space set aside, or is there a functioning commode? There, there is a functioning hardware on board the uh, Dragon to uh, make it so you don't need to, you know, 
do it the kind of old-fashioned diaper way, uh, kind of throughout the throughout the mission. So there is a, a functioning commode, and so uh, I'm sure that will be a, a test point that folks will have keen interest in uh, us getting some 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 data on uh, prior to the the next mission going forward. And I know that um, you've talked about starting traditions for this new era. Have you and Doug come up with any traditions yet that on lunch day? Um, I don't know if that will involve playing cards or, uh, you know, stops to the pad to, to, to you know, take an outdoor break. I, I, what, what have you come up with yet, or is that still TBD? Uh, we, we do have a, a, a series of things that we, you know, we plan to do go, going forward. Um, you'll see... I think the, the after we've accomplished them, it's a, it's a little bit uncertain as the schedule is being built right now as to what we'll be able to fit in opportunities wise. But uh, we're trying to draw upon our shuttle experience and uh, our knowledge of the Soyuz experience. Both Doug and I spent uh, quite a few uh, uh, launch trips, uh, if you will, over on the Kazakh side, being able to see what those traditions were. And so the things that we can incorporate, uh, we're definitely going to try to uh, do some of the same sorts of things with uh, dinners with uh, groups at, at specific times, um, using some of the historic locations at the Kennedy Space Center, like the, the beach house that was uh, that's, that's down there that's now a conference center but still has a nice beach house sign in front of it that we'll be able to utilize um, a, a chance for our families to uh, walk with us kind of solo uh, around the pad grounds uh, to get a kind of a, a private uh, a tour kind of late in the launch flow after the, the capsule is out on the pad. We'll plan to do all those things and, and there'll be some other traditions that you'll see as well that will unfold through the mission. But uh, we, some of the secrets will, uh, will, and traditions will probably play out, uh, uh, you know, just for future cruise knowledge as well. Well, uh, they, I guess I'll stay tuned. Um, you know, SpaceX in 10 years has gone from launching the very first rudimentary Dragon to putting astronauts on board. That's an amazing short period of time for a relative newcomer to aerospace business. Um, how amazing is that in your mind that they've been able to come so far in so little time? You know, I think it's been really remarkable what SpaceX has accomplished with the transition from building a, a new rocket to a, a capsule that heads to the International Space Station to transitioning to human flight. I, I also think that uh, it should come with a, a healthy dose of uh, realization as well that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't easy to get to where we are right now. Uh, Ten years is a, is a long time and we should have a, a healthy respect that uh, they were going at a pretty good clip to accomplish what they've accomplished. And so I'm, I'm proud of them. I'm proud to be a part of it. And I think a big part of that was the cooperation and partnership that they've been able to to build or that NASA has been able to build with them to share experiences, to make them um, as efficiently proceed forward as was possible. Well, listen, Bob, thank you so much and good luck. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you'll be watching uh, on the 27th of May. Oh, I'll be right here on my uh, front row seat. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.